Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 105, I chat with audio legend Mark Levinson about music and the art of audio reproduction. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded April 2nd, 2012. Episode 105, Legendary Mark Levinson. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of HomeTheater.com. This week's guest geek is audio legend Mark Levinson, who uh, is a name familiar to most audiophiles, I would say. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Hi. So nice to have you here. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover, so uh, we'll get right to it. Before we do, though, I just want to say that those of you who are watching the uh, live video at live.twit.tv or you're uh, logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Mark, and I'll pass on as many as I can. So, Mark, many people know your name. Uh, you've been in this business, the high-end audio business that we might call it for uh, decades now. Uh, but even before that, you were a professional musician, and, and you played with some of the uh, biggest names in jazz. Uh, I think you're a trumpet player, right, for primarily? I started with the trumpet, and then I changed to the flugelhorn, and then uh, played the double bass and worked with both. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, uh, who are some of the names that you've played with? Well, um, I was very fortunate to be around at the end of an era, so I got to play with um, Sonny Rollins and Stan Getz, Sonny Stitt, sit in with uh, John Coltrane and people like, you know, some of the really amazing wow. players in yeah, jazz. no kidding. And no then kidding. Uh, Chick Corea and, and Keith Jarrett are my contemporaries and um, fortunate to be able to play with them too and be friends. Man. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, well, you've really you've really seen some of the some of the and heard and played with some of the greats uh, of jazz in uh, in the 20th century. That's quite remarkable, actually. And and yet you're you're most well known probably for uh, for the work you do in audio electronics and speakers and so on. And the the first question I that I really want to ask is how does being a professional musician? How does your work as a musician? influence your work as an audio product designer? Well, actually, that's the beginning of it all. I, I was playing music and listening to the recordings that we were making, um, and it just didn't sound like what we played. I thought it would be nice to make it sound more like what we played, and that was the beginning of it all. Mm. And, and, and that's still the root of... Um, of my involvement, um, recreating a musical event. Um, I, I would say uh, um, I'm, I'm a musician first. I never studied f formally uh, anything in business or electronics. I, I, I had a great education from mentors like Dick Berwin, but um, formally my training is in music. Yeah. You, you mentioned that um, you're really your goal with audio electronics was to reproduce a musical event. And I've talked on this show before about whether or not it's actually possible to make a recording and play it back in a way that is indistinguishable from the live event. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you think? Well, I think the most important thing is the emotional response in a person. I, I don't think you can really recreate a musical event exactly as it was, but that's not important. What's really important is that you feel that you are with the musicians, that, that, that you are intimately connected, that you are, you know, that it's happening. And um, you can do that with a very simple system too. It's, it, it's, not, a, it's not about total performance actually it's about emotion 
music is emotion, not sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you can have all the sound in the world, but if you don't feel anything, it's just noise. And to get that emotion requires some kind of art. That's the thing. Right. There's no, there's no meter that tells you when it, when it, when it sounds like a piano or sounds like a trumpet or sounds like a violin, you you have to feel that. Right. And, but how do you get, how, what are the criteria that you use for developing an audio system such that it conveys the emotion or the feeling that you want to convey out of the musical performance um, as opposed well, to some, some uh, pie in the sky goal of, of making a recording indistinguishable from a live performance, which I think you, you would agree is, is not really possible. Well, I'm not, well, let's say with Daniel Hertz, we can come pretty close, much closer than we ever did, I think. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's, that's another story. But, um, I mean, you do have to um, have certain sonic attributes. You can't do it on magic dust. Um, <laughs> I would agree with but, that. <laughs> you know, I mean, we need a combination of engineering, a combination of science and the ear. You need both. And, um, I mean, Dick Berwin was and is a great mentor for me. When I was in my 20s, he told me, there is no substitute for good engineering. And I still believe that. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, engineering only goes so far. And in the end, you have to use your ear and your heart. And it isn't just the ear. It's it's the heart. It's it's the emotional. Actually, I would say it's more than emotion. It's It's basically love. You need love of music. And you need to activate that love of music. If that happens... You did it, um, but but so it's partly sound and, and and it's partly the other the other things that I mentioned. Right. But, right. Um, uh, go ahead. I think there's um, there's been a disconnect um, early in the century. People used to have one watt amplifiers and mono speaker, and people would listen for hours be captivated. And today people have all this expensive equipment and multiple channels and expensive this and that and the other thing. And, and they're getting bored, you know? Yeah. They're not captivated. Uh, and that's a pro, you know, I think that's a pity. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I, I've been trying to, to do something about that. Yeah. Um, Web, Web 48 to 11 in the chat room makes a great point. What sounds better, your favorite song on a transistor radio or a song you hate on a $50,000 stereo? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, a song I hate, I wouldn't listen to no matter what. Right, right. Period. Right, exactly. Um, <clears throat> well, this leads to the question, you know, you, you started out in high-end audio. Oh, first of all, before I ask, ask that question, I did want to mention or, or ask about, uh, is it, Dick Berman, Dave Berman, you mentioned Dick, before. Dick Dick Berwin. Berwin, Berwin. Pardon me. B R W E N. Yeah. How? I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm sad to say I don't recognize the name. Where does he come from? What What was his claim to fame in the in the business? How did you come to meet him? I met him in 1972. A friend of mine suggested that I should meet this guy, and I said okay. I went to so I called him and I went the Boston area, and met him, and that was the beginning of it all. Dick is one of the pioneers in audio. Um, he's now 84 and still working just as much as he did always. Um, he's a true genius. He's a scientist. He's an engineer. He's an audio engineer. He's a recording engineer. Um, he's come up through audio from the early days building his own vacuum tube amplifiers and speakers and, and so forth when he was 13 and um, right up through semiconductors and digital technology. And he, he has roots. He understands audio engineering. He understands science. And he also loves music. And he really gave me the, the original 
materials, the the concepts, the the um, the grounding, in order to be able to start an audio. Without Dick, I, I really wouldn't have been an audio. You wouldn't have been an audio guy. Well, I, I probably would have wanted to, but I wouldn't have known how. Right. He made it possible. Mentoring is very important, and not too many people get it. I'm very fortunate that I had mentoring in, in music, in audio technology, in the audio business. I've, I've been very fortunate. Yeah, and, and I think that you make a very good point that mentoring uh, is, is very important. Uh, certainly with music, you need a teacher uh to to show you the way you and i were talking about this uh before the show um mm-hmm. and and i think with uh with audio electronics or or really just about anything you, one wants to do and excel at uh you really need uh, to have someone show you the way point out when you're doing it well and when you're not doing it well and how you can improve and so on yeah and um you know dick is sort of like yoda in Star Wars, <laughs> you don't want to argue with him. I learned I learned early on um, if it started heading towards an argument, I better shut up and listen. Right, <laughs> he was right. <clears throat> yeah, I felt the same way about my certainly about my trombone teacher, um, and also when I you know talk with people like Joe Kane about video and so on, um, I really try to just shut up and listen. Well, uh, the question that I was about to ask was, you started in what we now call high-end audio before there really even was high-end audio. And I'm curious to, to one, I'm curious for your thoughts on how the whole industry, and we can talk about what, what, why it's an industry, uh, but how has it evolved and changed over the last, what, 30, 40 years? Well, I think... In the beginning, music reproduction was something people did for passion. Thomas Edison used to bite the piano lid because he was hard of hearing. And uh, <laughs> when he died, they noticed that his piano was all chewed up. <laughs> he was trying to get the vibrations into his head. And... I think in in, in in the early days of audio, people were involved because they loved it. It was something they just wanted to do, like an art form, you know. But over, mm-hmm. the, over the years, people discovered that they could make money doing it. That led to a non sequitur, which is the audio industry. There's no painting industry or sculpture industry or dance industry <laughs> it's a music industry. How, how, how can you have an art that's an industry i still can't figure that out mm-hmm. but I think what, what it points to is that for a lot of people and companies it's about money and that's okay you know people need to eat and it's good to have you know it's good to make profit but um Somehow, I, I think this has become a kind of virus, which has taken over in some way. And everything is about how do we make money? How do we make money? You know, it's not about um, how do we bring music to life? Mm-hmm. How, do we touch, how do we touch the heart? How do we make the best possible equipment that really means something? It's not, you know, somehow we this... Um, this part of the business got got, got off track. At least that's, oh, uh, that's real. Yeah, Dwayne Knight in the chat room is saying there are some painting mills, and and I have uh, that's probably true. You, you you see commercials sometimes for um, uh, art sales at hotels, and you know they've got you know oil paintings for twenty five bucks. Those those are probably generated in a you know in an art mill someplace, but uh, or a painting mill I should say. But I but I'm not sure I would call it art. Um, and then somebody else in the chat room, a Reverb Mike says, uh, "There's the film industry uh, about which we could say many of the same things." Well, a film industry is a little different because from the word go, it's about entertainment. 
I mean, some people use film as an art form, but by and large, film is is entertainment. Um, me, uh, of course, at its highest level, film is an art form. I believe that. Sure. And you know, uh, however, um, from pretty much the beginning, movies were about entertainment and making money. Although movies are often made from books, and writing is an art form, and sometimes the book is one thing and the movie is another, as you well know. So, sure. Yeah. Now, as SoCal Ray Jr. points out, music is entertainment, uh, or, or it certainly can be entertaining. Um, yes. But but there's, well, I think what you're what you're uh, alluding to here is perhaps that music and the the highest form of filmmaking and so on might very well be entertaining, but there is something transcendent about it as well, eh? Exactly. Um, one of the reasons that I I've, I've been studying Indian music for the last forty years is because Indian music is a devotional music at its root. Mm. And uh, it, it, it was not developed as entertainment. It was developed as um, a devotional practice. And the, the entire base of Indian music has very little to do with entertainment. Mm -hmm. it, it's that, but I mean, many musics have that as a root, um, but that's what I respond to personally the most. Um, and I think that that leads me to, to say something here, which is that <clears throat> that kind of music, which I call real music, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, if I may call it real music is in danger these days. It's uh, in danger of becoming extinct because the people who play it, find it very difficult to make a living doing it mm. and we better we better watch it because if we don't we're liable not to have those kind of great musicians around and we need them so that's partly what i've been doing these days is thinking about how to nourish real music that's really been the the focus of my of my work in audio recently Right. Uh, Beatmaster in the chat room asks, uh, what labels uh, do it, quote, right, unquote? Do you have any favorite um, record labels that, that you think do a better job than others? You know, I, I don't know enough about that right now. This, so, there's been so many, there, there have been so many developments that I'm not aware of, I'm sure. Um, but I have to say, I've seen very, very little out there that really moves me. I mean, if, if you listen to a Maria Callas recording from the 1950s, probably made with one microphone, the, the music is just so incredible. And the recording was not a production. It was just a microphone. Right. It just captured something, you know? And today, right. recordings are just so produced. And um, the whole... The whole, um, just the whole gestalt is about production. It's not about making music. Um, it's just really changed a lot. Uh, you know, I had an experience here that relates to that. Um, I did a project with the Opera House of Venice, La Fenice, and um, <clears throat> went into their archives with Jose Andrade, the opera singer, and um, created a 28 CD box set and a, and a 170 page art book as a benefit for La Fenice, which we could talk about later if you want. But anyway, oh, absolutely. these recordings were made by stagehands, not by professionals. They were like snapshots of live events. They needed to be remastered, but in the end, what you have is a snapshot of a musical event that was completely not produced and it has a vitality and a, an integrity that that's wonderful and i you know i i'd like to see more recordings made like that and in fact i am um creating a venture right now to do that so we will be recording some of the world's great artists like that 
mm-hmm. making the recordings available in, in, in different formats. Now, uh, you said earlier that uh, you, you had studied Indian music for a long time. It's one of my favorite musics as well. Um, and, and, I, and off camera, you said uh, that uh, it, those instruments, in particular the Indian instruments, posed an, an especially difficult challenge to recording and playing back in a way that, mm-hmm. um, that uh, evokes the emotion that, that they're intended to do. Uh, right. and, I, and I know, in fact, you have a sarod there. I'd love to hear you play it for a few for a few here. Okay, we'll just let's see. He's going he's gonna to be uh, changing uh, chairs there because he needs a chair without arms to uh, play the sarod, which is a, a classical Indian instrument. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, as he said, as Mark said, the classical Indian music is really intended more as a devotional expression. <laughs> rather than, certainly rather than entertainment. Um, but it's also very beautiful. And so uh, we're, we actually get to hear Mark play a little bit of it. Mm. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's a fretless instrument, right? Yeah, and it's completely no tech. Here's a coconut <laughs> shell. Coconut shell for a pick. Yep. You have a goat skin on the uh, on the instrument. Yeah. Of um wooden pegs, no metal no metal tuning <laughs> anywhere. Yeah. This is no tech. No just tech. the way I like it. Yes, indeed. And yet on the uh, and yet on the um, reproduction side, uh, you're you're pretty high tech. You you have started several audio companies over the years. Your most recent one is called Daniel Hertz, uh, which uh, which you are currently working on and uh, making products. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that company? First of all, where'd the name come from? Who is Daniel Hertz? Daniel is my father's name, and Hertz is my mother's family name. Heinrich Hertz, the physicist, was my great uncle. So oh, I, no kidding. I, decided, wow. I decided to use a family name since I couldn't use Mark Levinson as a trade name. Mm-hmm. So I use Daniel Hertz. Um, and um, uh, it's a Swiss company. Um, I decided by the, that. Uh, by the way, I'm, before you go on, I want to I, I want to quickly mention that you are my second European guest. You're talking to us from France right now, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, Daniel Hertz is a Swiss company, right? Um, you know, I'm 65, and I decided, well, it's time to put it all together. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm proud of all the products that I've been associated with and the, the very talented people that I've been so fortunate to work with. But there's some something in audio that just hadn't been done. And um, that, that basically is creating a high-efficiency system which is transparent and has no coloration. <clears throat> High efficiency is important because the lower the efficiency of the speakers, the more of the music gets turned into heat. It just is gone. Right. It's sort of like it's sort of like a WAV file and, and an MP3. You know, when you get mm-hmm. to an MP3, ninety percent of the file is just gone. That's yeah, the scientific so, fact. Right. The data is just thrown away. And that's basically what's happening now. Is that with the efficiency of most of the systems that are out there, including many so-called high-end systems. And you're talking about speakers here primarily, right? Well, it starts with the speaker. Let's start with the speaker and, and then go backwards. 
Okay. First, if the speaker efficiency is less than 100 dB for one watt, you're starting to lose information. And with the kind of sensitivity that is around now, like, you know, 89 or 86 or 84 or whatever they're doing, just mm-hmm. throwing away huge amounts of the music. And I thought it would be worthwhile to see if there was a way to combine the dynamics of, you know, the vitality of high efficiency with transparency and true high fidelity. And now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, live performance uh, speakers are are much more efficient than typical home speakers, but they have a lot of coloration. They're not particularly transparent. Am I correct on that? Right. They're, they're designed to play loud and not break. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what they do. <clears throat> but on the other hand, when you hear a Daniel Hurt system, you just realize how much music we haven't been hearing. And this accomplishes certain things that are very important to me. One of them is the inflection that musicians give You know, the beginnings of notes, what's soft, what's loud, the the whole dynamic presentation comes to life. And and that's a big part of what musicians do, you know, especially good ones. Yes, (laughs) indeed. and, 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 And the other thing is that harmonics and uh, the subtleties in the sound just tend to get lost. And, you know, maybe the overall sound is pleasing, but normally what brings them, what brings the music to life gets lost. And I, I think we've really done something about that. Now, just now, high efficiency speakers is only part of it. Then you have to design a new kind of amplifier to drive them because most amplifiers, at least solid state ones, are, are, are not that good in the milliwatt range. But when you are generating 100 decibels with one watt. It means most of the time you're listening in the milliwatt range, right? Right. So the amplifier has to be really good down there. And that's something. And a lot new. of most, most amplifier so, companies don't pay much attention to the milliwatt range, I guess, right? Right. Or people go back to vacuum tubes, but then they give up the damping factor and the output current and the headroom and all that rest of this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so putting it all together is what we try to do. Here and then, um, and then on, in in the preamp, trying to create a control unit that was transparent enough not to screw it all up, uh, uh, and that was another job. Anyway, um, I have to say that um, I I don't expect Daniel Hertz to become a big company, and certainly don't want to play the high-end audio game. Um, been there, done that. <laughs> but, but I did want to make this available. I think the audio world needs a new reference, something that that goes beyond the limits of what's what's been available. And it means a lot to me to... Mm-hmm to again have found such talented and dedicated people and uh, be involved in something like this. Now, a mixer in the chat room asks uh, about ribbon tweeters. Do your speakers use ribbon tweeters? No. But Daniel Hertz, I mean? No. Ribbons have their charms, and I like them. Uh, Mi- mixer in the chat room as points out that they're particularly efficient. Well, yes, but they have other problems, and... Um, of course, you can get great sound in different ways. There's not only one way, sure. but but one of the things that I found is that um, if you look hard enough and you meet the right people, it's amazing what you can trip over. And <laughs> we, were, um, we have some high efficiency driver designers now that are just really amazingly good at what they do. And I have to say, as much as I like ribbons, I don't miss them now Mm. with what we have now. But it was a good point. Yeah, yeah. 
Sandman in the chat room uh, points out that Nelson Pass says that the first watt is the most important, which seems to be similar to what you're saying. Well, that's a, I, I would agree with him. Only problem is with most speakers that are out there, one watt doesn't buy you a whole lot of sound pressure. But but he's right. That's true. And and certainly with uh, Daniel Hertz speakers, you said are a hundred dB per watt. And one decibel, watt, I mean, for one watt eight ohms. Um, basically, our speakers use about six percent of the power of normal speakers. So they're pretty efficient. Yeah, no kidding. And and you're you're claiming that they that in so doing. They are delivering more of the information in the recording, more of the emotional impact that would otherwise be lost. Well, it's not a claim and it's not an opinion. It's a scientific fact. The okay. lower the efficiency, the more information is turned into heat. That's True just, enough. You can, you can just calculate it. Sure. I mean, course. you know, people today, you know, like a lot of audiophiles turn up their nose at MP3 and, you know, at all the information that it, it, that's lost there. Then they go and listen on a system that's doing the same thing. I mean, you know, there's so much in, in today's audio world that has crept in that is just basically costing us musical information. I mean, back in the 1930s, efficiency of 100 dB was common. They had to have it because their amplifiers were only one watt or two watts. Right. So, I mean, in some ways, we, we've gone backwards, unfortunately. Yeah. What is, your, what is your feeling of solid state versus vacuum tube in terms of amplification? Well, there's a lot to be said for vacuum tubes, but they have their limits. And, and um, I've been involved with vacuum tube amplification, but I just haven't been able to find the total performance that I'm looking for with tubes. Uh, I mean, basically... Whatever makes you happy is okay. You know, if you're happy, you use I couldn't it. agree more. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, I, I wouldn't tell people to use this or use that. I would just say that with the Daniel Hertz M5 amplifier and M6 preamp, I'm pretty happy. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. But on the other hand, you can certainly get great performance with tube equipment too. Maybe um, not can, like this. But. What can can you be more specific about what? Uh, tubes uh, don't do for you what what uh, what they're missing. <clears throat> well, you know, you can get into arguments about that. Yeah, I mean, which is a, which is an audiophile pastime for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that. I would just say, okay. <laughs> you know, you can make great sound with tubes or with solid state, but in the end, for me uh, to get what I'm looking for right now, I couldn't. I wouldn't try to do it with tubes. Mm. I don't, what I don't about, think it's What about uh, the difference between uh, analog amplification and so-called digital amplification or class D amplification? Well, <clears throat> analog amplification has been around a long time. And digital amplification is quite new. Uh, of course, digital amplification can be done at very low cost. And I think when digital amplification is refined uh, to a very high level, then great sound is possible for the wider audience. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. But that's, that's just starting to happen right now, and it's something that I've been involved with. And I think we are right now at the beginning of a time when class D amplification can work very, very w well, um, if, if certain things are done and, um, I'm involved in the, um, the birth of that, um, as a reality, but it's not yet on the market, but it, it hopefully will be soon. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, Titus I mean, and, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, I personally, I think it would be a great thing to have very inexpensive equipment that sounds terrific. And, and it, it's a lot easier to do that with, for example, class D amplification. Also because of the DSP, you can put software in the DSP and accomplish some pretty good things. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's just in its infancy. Understood. 
Um, <clears throat> Titus in the chat room uh, is asking about sealed speakers with um, uh, noble gases like nitrogen or so. Have you ever heard of such a thing? No. Hmm. I, I hadn't either, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Um, let's see. Somebody else in the chat room... I, uh, is is asking a question that uh, we can spend just a moment on, and I'm just trying to find it here. Uh, I can't find who it is, but they ask, uh, what's happening with re- Red Rose Music? That's a company that no longer exists, right? Well, it's dormant. Um, Red Rose Music um, was started in 19... Um, about 1998, and... The idea I had was to make very high quality equipment that was compact and, and less expensive and, um, um, you know, within reach of more people. And um, a number of things happened that were unfortunate, particularly 9 11, and that was really a disaster for us. And uh, um, Red Rose products, some of the Red Rose products are available, uh, but um, uh, it's it's basically dormant at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. I would say if people are, are interested in Red Rose, they can uh, send me an email, care of the Daniel Hertz site, for example, or the Red Rose site. I'd be happy to answer their questions. Okay. You you mentioned that Red Rose products were uh, intended to be more affordable, available to a wider audience. That bring, mm-hmm. and 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 the Daniel Hertz products are really your uh, exactly what you want at the highest level. Uh and um Diego Kid in the chat room asks, what about the price points for Daniel Hertz products? I think they're pretty expensive, aren't they? Well, what I what I thought in the end, was that um, my role here is to innovate and to look at what really needs to be done. And there are a number of companies making good equipment that's affordable. But I really felt that no one was dealing with the reality of making the kind of real no compromise reference system that could be made. Mm-hmm. And I decided I wanted to do that. And it has a place because it points the way. It shows what's possible. And and I just thought that needed to be done, and I wanted to do it, and I did it. And it's here. So I feel good about that. But, but um, you know, it's sort of like a piano. You can make an upright piano that's more affordable, you can make a nine foot concert grand that's not so affordable, <laughs> but, they're both good. but they're both good. You know, one they is both a, can be good. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, they're just different. And I, I just felt it was time for me to make a, a concert grand. And that's really what I wanted to do. Gotcha. Also, also the other thing is that to do high efficiency very well is expensive because you need a big, Speaker, you need a big box. You can't do it with a small speaker. It's just not going to happen. It's laws of physics. Right. And, and when you make a very big, very well-made, very good speaker, it gets expensive. There's no way around it. Speaking of the speakers, uh, we haven't mentioned yet where they're, where they're actually manufactured, which I find very interesting. Daniel Hurd's speakers are made at the Petrov piano company in the Czech Republic. Uh, Petrov makes what I consider the finest piano in the world today. And these are real music people. They're not executives and they're not box builders. They're musical instrument makers. And they shared with me the the, uh, enthusiasm for building what I had in mind. So um, Daniel Hurt's speakers are built by musical instrument makers in the factory there uh, uh, at Petrov. <clears throat> and um, interestingly enough, um, there's more to that than meets the eye, one of which is, um, for example, the M1s have an 18-inch subwoofer. 
a 12 inch and, and a high frequency driver. And when that system is cranking deep, powerful bass, you can touch the cabinet and feel no vibration, virtually no vibration. And that's because the people who make these cabinets not only listen, but they touch. You know, musical instrument makers touch this thing, listening. And vibration is part of it. It's not only sound, it's the vibration. So there's a lot of there's a lot of soul in those speakers and also the electronics. But I have to say, um it's a pleasure for me and 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 one thing for sure is that these are products that nobody will ever throw out. They're going to be around a long time. Uh, like like a great piano, you know, you don't throw it out. Right. It, 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 it's on the planet. I mean, a really great instrument is on the planet for a long time. And in, in, in fact, that's kind of the hallmark of a great instrument. It doesn't go out of style. It doesn't end up in the garbage, you know. Right. Exactly right. It's, it's inherently valuable. Uh, Mixer in the chat room asks, what do you use for an audio source? Are you a vinyl guy or CDs or DVD audio? Well, you know, I'm an analog guy at heart, but my feeling is that we need to make digital work for a couple of reasons. The most important one is that if we don't, musicians won't have income from recordings. And if they don't have income from recordings, then we might not have the musicians anymore. So we better make it work. So I've been working on that. And actually, uh, I found some new ways of um, uh, treating PCM audio so that it really does uh, sound and feel like analog and that'll be in the recordings that I make and people will be able to check that out if they want to. But I mean, I mean, I would say that normal PCM as it is today is, is pretty rough, but, but there's hope. And, uh, if people are interested, they can keep an eye out for what we're doing and maybe check it out. I, I I think, I I think, I, I think people will be surprised. Now, uh, I mean, Beatmaster, I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, go, go, ahead. go right ahead, please. No, I, mean, I just say just that, you know, of course, I enjoy LPs. I love analog tape. That's my favorite. But um, I think, it, you know, again, I think it's really important to, to um, you know, to work on all fronts. And so the people who are making LPs are doing something worthwhile. And people who are recording on analog tape... More power to you too. Um, I, I, um, um, I'm. I should say that um, there will be a Mark Levinson library of recordings on iTunes pretty soon, and people might want to check that out. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I, before we get to the last topic of conversation, a Beatmaster in the chat room has asked a really great question. Okay. How far how far does culture go play into the perception of sound? Uh, the U.S., Europe, and Japan have very different views on how audio should sound. How does how does this play into your work? Well, I found pretty much that. Um, well, let's say I, I should probably talk from personal experience. The products that I've made in the past. Let's say, like starting with the LNP2 preamplifier in 1974, is highly collectible everywhere in Asia, for example, in the mm-hmm. United States, in Europe. So that product and others like the ML2 and um, the Audio Palette and and so on and so on have transcended culture. Doesn't matter where you are, you know people hold these products in high value. And so that has led me to to feel that if you really make a great product, people will love it everywhere. Um, but, but it's true 
that people hear a bit differently in different cultures, but that's more like, um, um, I think that tends to be more of a musical perception. <clears throat> like if you have American ears and you hear blues, it sounds like blues. If you have American ears and you hear Indian music, you're not hearing it like Indian people do. Mm. You're hearing, hearing American ears. But Indian people are hearing it with Indian ears. It means something different to them because of the way they've been brought up and, and you know, uh, they just, they'll feel differently about what's played. In fact, when I studied Indian music in the beginning, I realized that I, I had to unlearn a lot of what I had learned in order to start studying Indian music. It's like I had to unscrew my head and empty it out and put it back on and start over again. <laughs> um, <coughs> so Beatmaster is right, I think, and I would agree with him that um, the culture you are brought up with, uh, brought up in, does influence how you hear music. But I suspect that, you know, quality is quality. Yes. And while the music may may influence you in a different way, if it's played back at high quality, it's going to have a greater impact than if it's played back at a lower quality. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I mean, I've I've um, I've done so many events during the during the last forty years, uh, playing different audio systems in different countries and. Um, um, I have to say, like you said, great products and great sound really do transcend culture. Um, I have to say, that's been my experience. Yeah. Uh, some people in the chat room are wondering about your the equipment behind you. And I wonder if you could just take a moment to, to point out what you've got back there. Sure. Well, let's see. The speaker here is the um, the M1, and you'll see. Is that, the, is that the flagship speaker? Yeah, this is a, a biamplified speaker. So there's a mono amp driving the 18 inch, and then there's a mono amp driving the 12 and the high frequency driver. There you can see the electronics here. So you have two amps for the left channel, two amps for the right channel, and the preamp driving everything. Mm -hmm. um, and these amplifiers have the crossovers built in. So they're 18 dB per octave, 80 hertz active crossovers built into the amplifier. So you have a switch here. So you can switch low pass, high pass, or flat right in the face of the amp. And then you can attenuate in 1 dB steps here just to match the levels, which you don't have to, I mean, they're always the same as you know, it's calibrated. Now, I understand you use some pretty special um, attenuators even on those amps, right? Oh, well, yes, that, you, you have to do that. Um, we, um, uh, in fact, on the preamp, we're using the, um, um, a modern version of the original Penny and Giles aerospace control that um, I developed back in the 70s. But this is this is an unbelievably good control. I mean, the thing about Daniel Hertz is we just decided to go wherever we had to, you know, to get the best parts. And it's a very internationally oriented company that way. Um, but um, um, you really can't overlook anything in a system like this. You just have to pay attention. Right. Mixer in the chat room asks if the if the amps driving each part of the speaker are the same power or do you give more power to the woofer? They are the same amplifier. Exactly. Mm. You just okay. set the crossover to be high pass or low pass. Ah, right. Okay. So in one, in one case it's low pass in one case it's high pass. Right. Um, <clears throat> we only have a few minutes left and, and in that time I really want to, to um, return to a project that you alluded to a moment uh, earlier in the show uh, called La Fenice, which is the opera right. house in Venice, I believe, right? Right. Venice, Italy. Actually, yep. Um, I'd like to say that 
as everybody knows, the world is in a global economic crisis. In Italy, it's really catastrophic. And I love Venice and have a special feeling for that city. And I, I approached La Fenice, the opera house there, about doing a benefit. And the idea was that patrons who contribute 1,000 euros to La Fenice could get a gift. And in this case, the gift is a 28 CD box set of opera, symphony, solo piano, and jazz um, recordings from 1966 uh, to 1987. Um, I remastered all of these, and I can say, musically and sonically, this is a jewel. And this is um, a 170-page art book, um, which, you know, it's a coffee table art book that goes with the CDs. Um, if anybody's interested, you know, they're welcome to contact me. Uh, we're just starting to launch this benefit. Um, what's interesting about about the set of CDs is that the musicians include people like Arthur Rubinstein playing solo piano, the modern jazz quartet, Renato Scotto. You know, these are the greatest artists of the era. And here, they weren't making a recording. They were performing. So these are snapshots of them doing what they did then. And uh, it's, it's quite a special set. It's, and uh, it's also, I think, important for people who buy audio equipment that's more expensive than the normal to maybe um, think about making some contribution to music. You know, this is a good way to do it. Sure. Another way uh, that you've told, you've told me about and I've actually heard is uh, some recordings of some very young uh, Russian pianists um, at the, uh, what is it, the Tchaikovsky Conservatory? Yes. Uh, I was in Moscow in 2010 for actually the end of 2010 um, for the launch of Daniel Hertz. And um, I recorded a, uh, a concert at the Czech Embassy uh, organized by Petrov. And um, there were ch basically children, eight years old, 12 years old, 14 years old, playing so beautifully. It's heartbreakingly beautiful. And I recorded it. The idea was to record it and play it back on the Daniel Hurt system, which was in the ambassador's private suite right around the corner. I mean, just, I mean, uh, you know, 30 feet away from the piano. Sure. And, um, and we did that. But I was so blown away by what these kids did. I said, look, why don't you take these recordings and make a CD and give the money to the conservatory and the students? So they did it. And that CD is really something. Anybody who's interested in the copy is welcome to send me an email and tell them how to get it. That's a, that's a beauty. The, 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 I mean, there's something about Russian classical music that knocks me out. I don't know what it is. It's just some kind of soul. It's just fantastic. Yeah. How did you how did you go about recording the piano? I mean, uh, I assume you used somewhat minimal recording technique, not a lot of microphones and stuff like that. You know, I'm a relic. Um, I just use two mics. I, I, I never use more than two mics. So sometimes I think about using one, but uh, haven't done that. Yet. I'm basically uh, using two mics. I guess you got to do stereo. So did you did you put the you two mics? No. You know, you don't have to do stereo. Actually, you don't. Um, mono can sound fantastic. Someday, I predict we're going to go back to it. Nevertheless. <laughs> well, that, that'd be an interesting day, I think. Um, well, did you, no, I mean, did you put the mic? Stop to stop, think about it. You got a left and a right. But where's the music? It's in the middle. So what does that tell you? Mm, true enough. Except that a piano, for example, a piano uh, is a very large thing, and some of the sound is coming from one part of it, and some of the sound is coming from another part of it in a different location. This brings although, this gets back. To although, if you're in an audience, by the time the waveform hits you, it's basically a, a, a mono waveform. 
You true don't enough. know. True enough. You don't know which part is where. Yeah, I mean that's true. Uh, but what about what about a, an ensemble where you have a, a violin on the right side of the stage and a cello on the left side of the stage? Still, the the directionality there would be important. Yes, but we pay a price for stereo. I mean, this is all in the Bell Labs papers from 1936. <laughs> I remember when I was in, when I was in my twenties, um, I saw Paul Klipsch at an AES convention, and I went up to him and asked him some questions, and he said, young man, have you read the Bell Labs papers from 1936? I was like, oh, oh, oh no. Um, he said, well, you should. <laughs> and I said, well, where can I get them? He said, I'll send them to you. So he did, and he was right. They, they, it's, he, people want to talk about mono, stereo, and multi-channel. Read the Bell Labs papers from 1936. These guys are pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will have to do that too then. <laughs> um, anyway, my, my last question was just about um, uh, your recording technique. Did you put the mics sort of out in the, not in the audience perhaps, but or were they stuck into the piano? Well, I have this kind of old-fashioned idea that you ought to put the microphones where it sounds good to your ears. I sort of move my head around until I find this place where it really sounds the best, and I put the microphones there. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. But, I mean, how can you get a good sound someplace where it isn't? Yeah, true enough. True enough. And then what was the medium you recorded onto? Uh, I, I'm using a Sound Devices 722. Oh, yeah. It's a fantastic recorder. And, but um, it's the process that I'm using after that's really where the action is. Because, as I said, just Recording in PCM is not something I I, I want to do, but with this process, it really really does come to life. And I, doesn't the doesn't the sound devices record PCM? Yes, but, but that's okay because after the fact, we can you do, do your something. mastering magic. Well, you have to do something, right? <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Well, listen, Mark, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. I sure do appreciate your being here, staying up late, uh, being in France as you are. And um, I thank you so much for your time. Scott, I really want to thank you for having me here. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. I I want to give my best regards to everybody who's watching and thank them as well. Thank you. Very good. Uh, You can uh, read all about what Mark's doing these days at danielhertz.com, from which you can send him emails, as he has invited uh, for a couple of different things. So uh, please avail yourself of that. A very interesting guy that uh, I hope to have on the show again sometime. My online home, of course, is hometheater.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at HT Geek Scott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Bob Hodis, an acoustician and studio and listening room designer uh, with uh, lots of interesting credits to his name. So we're going to be talking all about room acoustics on next week's show. And I sure hope you'll join me. Until then, geek out. <laughs>